All right. Hello, vlog. New York City edition. Fun fact, I actually recorded uh, this vlog already, and then I found out only when I went to upload it that the file was recorded in slow-mo. So there was no audio, and it was like two hours long because everything was halftime. So anyway, um, here we are um, in the city. Um, I came into New York today um, to meet with a potential strategic partner. Um, occasionally that will happen. Occasionally um, a very uh, potentially transformative deal for the company comes along. Um, in this case, it's not uh, like mergers and acquisition, but that can be a type of deal. A big distribution partner can also be a type of deal. Um, a partnership, um, uh, there's really a, probably a small handful of deal types that have the potential to really transform the business. Um, and when they come knocking, then it's usually the job of the CEO, unless you're in a much bigger company and you have senior vice presidents, vice presidents, executive vice presidents. Um, but in the startup, uh, early stage company, it's the job of the CEO to represent the business, um, all the stuff that's going on in the operations, the vision of the business, and the culture. So ops, vision, culture all come together, represented by you. Um, and, um, you know, just uh, essentially be an ambassador for your own company. Um, much like a political ambassador goes out to neighboring nations, sometimes nations afar, sometimes in turmoil. Sometimes in times of peace. It depends on what the particular strategic objectives are. Um, but in any case, um, it's the job of the CEO to, to do that. And um, uh, I remember a time when I was first getting started um, when anytime there was a critical decision to make, um, I would really lean heavily on my mentor because my mentor had a lot of experience. And so I was more certainly I was more likely to make the right call if I had my mentor dip in and help me out pretty much. Um, but eventually I learned that anytime I had a big decision, I would pretty much lean on my mentor. And uh, I discovered that I more or less felt crippled to make a decision unless I had somebody with more experience kind of um, helping me make the decision. And I realized that I didn't like that. Um, and I realized pretty much that I was outsourcing my judgment to a mentor. And so I decided that the next time I had a critical business decision, um, and look, if it's make or break, then obviously you want counsel. But um, I wanted an important strategic decision or operational decision. And this is when I was 18, just starting out. And I would intentionally not call upon anybody. I would make the decision myself. And I remember I made that decision. I forgot what the thing was, but I remember I made the wrong call. And you pretty quickly know if you make the right or the wrong call, like days, sometimes hours afterwards, sometimes weeks, but more commonly days. And I remember being proud that even though I got the decision wrong, I made the call myself. And, um, and it, you know, it wasn't until I, I pretty much leaned into doing that at a young age, making the call myself. And you'll hear a lot of times people say, why make the mistakes of others? Like, like don't repeat the mistakes of others. You can learn everything in a book and, um, and avoid the mistakes of others. I guess that that makes sense intellectually, but experientially I haven't found that to be true, right? Like if you put your hand on a stove and you burn your, the shit out of your hand, okay, you now, like, obviously, intellectually, you know not to touch the stove, but when it happens to you, you have a very visceral, physiological response that you can pair to that idea. And I think that, you know, business and really any craft is the same way. Um, I believe in making your own mistakes. And when you make your own mistakes, when you make your own decisions, when you get your own reps in, that's what builds your um, your capacity to make the calls. 
Um, you'll never know how to make decisions in grind time if you don't actually literally practice making decisions when it counts, when it matters most. So with that said, um, you know, and, and by the way, sometimes there isn't a right or wrong call. Sometimes there's just a call and it could go either way. And that's something I also learned just from making a lot of decisions over time. And what you'll find is your company and really any organization is just the accumulation of a lot of decisions made over a period of time. You are your decisions, so to speak. Um, and so why do I bring that up, that whole story about my mentor? Well, because closing deals is the same way. Um, I've had to fumble through a lot of deals that didn't close from a young age. Back when I was um, running a dry cleaner and pitching movie productions on the literal side of the road, back when I would knock on doors cold and convince people to give me their dry cleaning as an 18-year-old kid, back when I was running an incubator and I had to convince a real estate developer to give me office space for free, in exchange I would get his whole area bumping with startups and it would bring and attract people and help the area grow. Back when I had to convince people to um, join me in investing in a uh, at the time, little known city of Allentown because I saw a vision there for um, real estate. Um, back when you know we were convincing people to invest in four under 30-year-old kids to raise a venture capital firm around the idea that we would invest in people of color. At the time when, I know that that's somewhat common now, we were the first institutionally backed venture firm for diversity with a diversity focus um the only person who who was first but uh, was arlen hamilton at backstage capital and i don't think at the time they were institutionally backed i think they had raised some money um although i may be wrong on that but um yeah and and so i've gotten those reps in of closing deals and you can become a closer sometimes deals right at the tippy teetering edge they don't close for some reason there's volatility there's always things that happen you got to flex that muscle as a ceo nobody is going to do it for you um and so anyway the reason i touched on the mentor concept is because just like you have to literally practice making decisions over and over you also have to practice closing deals and the only way to get good at either one of those is to screw it up a lot fumbling the bag over and over and over, making the wrong calls over and over and over. And you might know of a more efficient way to learn, right? And if you do, amen. But for me, um, I've always been a learner by doing. Um, anything I want to try and learn, I just go and do it at a small scale first and very frequently. And then over time, I learn the skill. I've learned a lot of different industries that way. I know media, I know real estate, I know insurance now, cold. I didn't know anything about insurance. Now I run a full-fledged insurance company. Um, and it starts by literally just like learning the first vocabulary term and asking a lot of questions about that and then speaking to somebody else and fumbling my way through. If you never, if you're, if you're not comfortable sounding dumb, then chances are you're not going to learn something new. Also, if you're not comfortable looking dumb, chances are you're not going to learn something new. Um, and so anyway, yep, so got called into the city to represent Loop, um, uh, a, a good potential partnership for us. Um, and most of these things, by the way, don't close. I think it's not a great position to be in to have your hopes or your trajectory hinging on any type of partnership. You need to build your business so that it's standalone impactful, standalone effective, standalone efficient, and standalone has visibility to get to profitability so that you can sustain your business and grow from there. Um, um, no one strategic partner should be in a position to make or break your business. That's not what this is about. However, in the process of building your company, occasionally come partners that have the potential to augment your business. And if what you have built is already good, then 
there comes a time to augment those partnerships. Like for example, one that just came to mind randomly is like Apple. Apple handled their own distribution for the longest time and they never sold through the telecom companies. They never sold through Verizon and AT&T and Steve Jobs is kind of super adamant about controlling the sale of Apple through the iPhone. And maybe you can attribute it to, you know, it being a Tim Cook era thing. But at some point, Apple, you know, brought in their distribution. You can see Apple kiosks at Best Buy. You can buy Apple, obviously, through AT&T and, Tel and Verizon and so on. And that has helped grow their distribution massively. Um, but I think if Apple would have started without the Apple Store and instead just gone wide distribution, you know, I don't think that they would have had the same brand power and control. And so, you know, there's layer, there's kind of levels to the building um, of your business. And you can take a plethora of different strategies. Um, but for us, we have felt like it has been really, really important to nail down all the core aspects of our business first. Um, resist the temptation to enter into any uh, distribution partnerships or really partnerships of any kind other than the necessary ones. Um, dial in the economics, dial in our margins, dial in our brand, dial in our product. Um, and you know, probably for the first time in three years since we started, I feel like we're um, probably one quarter away from being mostly dialed in. I will say it's amazing how long it takes um, to actually be really at the starting line, at the starting point. When we first started, I thought we'd breeze by, build the full tech, get the full team going, get all the regulatory approvals, the reinsurance deals, the blah, 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 like super fast. But in actuality, it's taken three years and we've built a sizable business in that time. And, you know, but, but like it hasn't been where we've wanted it to be. And so sometimes the game is just getting as far as you can and making as much progress as you can with what you have. And at the same time, building the thing to get to the point where you want to be. Um, and I do think that there comes a time when you arrive at that point. And I would say that, um, you know, we're pretty close. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and as a result of being close, you know, now is the time to explore different types of things that can augment our efforts, so to speak. So anyway, I, um, as I said, that first clip that I recorded was like long and maybe pretty good. Who, who knows? It's the lost tapes. Um, so I just, um, I woke up early. I drove in. I took calls on the way here. I got here. I took my meeting in person. I had some calls afterwards. Um, um, did lunch. Just did some steps here. Um, I do a daily low heart rate cardio situation just to get my blood moving, break a sweat. Just did that. And now I'm about to go eat some dinner. And then tomorrow, you know, I'll get out of here. I remember there was a time when I used to love work travel. I just felt so important to be out on the road and stuff. Um, and I loved it. I would go to Omaha and Virginia and uh, Nashville and LA and San Francisco. And I would stay for extra days at a time, you know, and that's appropriate for what I, where I was then, you know, I just wanted to see as much as I could these days. I still want to see, but, um, honestly, I just, I just really value having my kind of like, I guess routine, um, because my work is so violently intense and fast paced in my personal life. I've come to really appreciate just the power of routine and, um, you know, Nas says routine builds character, and I agree. Um, you know, just like foods, like diet, dieting, especially, you know, your health, your fitness, your space, uh, and all that stuff. So anyway, it doesn't hurt to travel, but um, these days I don't prolong my business trips at all. They don't necessarily feel like some fun escape. Um, it just feels like part of the job. So um yeah, I think over time, you know, really become 
kind of a professional CEO. Um, and it was always my childhood dream to be in this position and I'm here and I'm grateful. Um, but also, you know, it's like a professional basketball player. Like at some point you realize it's a job. Um, and then you go through a period where you treat it like a job, but then you remember the love of the game. Um, and then the, the best place to be is when you remember the love of the game and you also remember you're a professional. And if you can merge those, you know, and you add in, you keep the high level of work ethic and integrity, you know, you can become a LeBron or a Kobe. So I think last year was that real, uh, probably 2021 through 2023 was, uh, 2022 and 2023 were really those years where it like hit me that I'm a professional, like, not like I'm a pro because I've been doing it for X amount of time, although I have, but I'm a pro in that like I've entered the big leagues and I have institutions invested in me that expect reporting, you know, all that stuff that we talk about on the blog. That was like the moment of the last couple of years, but you enter a place now where I'm entering a place now where, um, you know, I'm settling into that new reality. I've settled into it. Um, and then you blink and you realize, oh shit, we actually built something that's pretty fucking cool, pretty interesting, pretty valuable, and it helps people. And it's kind of exactly what I've wanted to do this whole time. And, you know, it, it just was such a heads down intense thing that I really honestly just looked up, blinked and realized that it's built um, and went through the growing pains of being a professional. And then, you know, hopefully this is the year where it kind of all comes together. Um, and I don't think this is going to be kind of our crazy growth year because the market is still in a, in a weird place. But if we make enough progress this year and really show everybody um, that, you know, what we're made of, our team, we show our team that the thing that they've fought hard to build has legs. We show our partners, our investors, our board, our reinsurers, everybody involved, our customers that, hey, you stuck it through with us. This thing is awesome. This thing is meaningfully better now because of your support. And uh, we've gotten to this point. Um, all of a sudden, you can really poise yourself for, you know, a really breakout 2025. Um, and that doesn't have to be wild, ridiculous top line growth, um, particularly in an insurance because it's kind of an underwriting business. So you sometimes don't want to grow super fast, but growth in all the right ways, growth in the mission, growth in our members, growth in the team, growth in our confidence, growth in our prospects, growth in all the right ways. So with that, I'm going to go grab some dinner, but um, I did want to make sure I came on here and uh, dropped a vlog for you. So I'm just going to press upload real quick and hopefully um, uh, you guys will enjoy. So thank you and see you guys soon. Peace.